Nice hit a really strong note with me there. It's difficult enough to reach the top, but it's even harder to stay there once you've gotten there at that point. And that's what Hunter Ace is striving to try to achieve this year. He's made it to the top. Can he stay there this year? It's a great point. It's something that Tice really blazed the trail in doing where, you know, back-to-back -back European champion is one of the things that's always held up um, in Tice's legacy as a competitive Hearthstone player. And I think perhaps to me the most impressive thing about Tice, this is something that I alluded to earlier as well, is that even though he has diverted to being more of a streamer and a content creator and an entertainer these days, when he wants to flick the switch and turn it back on, he absolutely can do. He proves that if he puts the time in, you know, grinds out for a couple of weeks to get right the way back up to speed, he is just, he's on that level with everyone else. And I was surprised to see his results last season not reflect that. But, you know, it's an incredibly tough division, particularly in Europe. It's, I, I, I know we sort of meme back and forth with each other, not just me and you, but with the other casters. I think with how much of a meme it's become, like, distracts from the point of how adamant I am that Europe is actually the best region, like, by some distance. Stats from, like, the Masters Tour so far will bear that out as well in terms of, like, the Grand Masters results. But someone in the Europe region was going to have to suffer, and Tice was just one of those players. Indeed it was. And so you saw there from the protection and ban screen what was going on. Uh, in terms of what they protected during that phase and then what was banned out during that phase. And for Hunter Ace, uh, it's left him with Paladin, Priest, and with Mage as the three decks that he has. And he's kicking it off with Paladin, which, Saddle, at the start of the show, you had mentioned that this was the deck you had your eye on as the most interesting deck brought to Europe this week. Yeah, it's something that I considered coming into this was just how much Paladin we were going to see, if any. I considered it a deck that we might see people be using just because of something that we alluded to earlier in this format, where you bring four decks, one of them gets banned, but then you still only play a best of three. So what that leaves you with is potentially like this floating deck situation where you can have a deck that you use in the series that you want to use it in, um, a deck with more polarized matchups. And then if you need to hide that deck and just not play it in a series, you have the ability to do that. And I think um, Holy Wrath Paladin kind of fits that description pretty well. So I was expecting one or two players to take a punt on it. It's actually ended up being a little bit more common than even I expected. Um, but Hunter Race's version in particular does have that Zephyrus the Great thrown in there as well. Zephyrus, not just a tool for Highlander decks, but a tool you can consider with decks that want to draw towards the, uh, the last few cards because if you, it's not just duplicates starting in your deck, it's duplicates remaining in your deck. If you can get down to the point where you've drawn one copy of every card, that Zephyrus is active. So that's why we're seeing it in this Holy Wrath Paladin from Hunter Race and also, for example, in rogue decks that play Myra's Unstable Elm. Yeah, it's a, it's a really strange card, but one I definitely well love. I, I can't wait to see that card just continue to get flushed out as well as the, uh, the patches from the de developers come in to try to increase the... IQ of Zephyrus so that he recognizes board states better. Uh, I think it's a challenge that they have uh, undertaken very ambitiously, to say the least. I I think they're quite attached to this card and they're really invested on making it you know work as powerfully as it can do. Um, Celestalon. I'm never sure if I'm saying that right. Chad, one of the Hearthstone developers Celestalon, on yeah. is Celestalon on on Twitter recently, I, I believe announced, I will say, kind of teased in meme format that um, Zephyrus will be receiving another IQ update patch uh, coming this Monday, I believe. To my side. For Tice, he's running on the Highlander Hunter deck, and some of the highlights that were in here for me, uh, cards that I think are fairly core to the strategy, Hunter's pack, definitely one of them. Uh, from there, it looks like a pretty standard list uh, all the way up. You know, Highlander Hunter has a lot of very powerful cards in it, I think that the secret package is something that you perhaps get to mess with a little bit. And then at the one drop slot with the secret keeper, spring paw, and tracking. Right. Uh, we saw Kalinto have the shimmer fly in his as well. And shimmer fly is a card that I really like in this deck. It just gives you something to do on turn one and opens up possibilities later down the road. But this is really the bread and butter, I think, of the Highlander deck and of Hunter decks in general right now. Is the Hyena Alpha just providing so much board presence in one card. Right. That uh, two mana consecration pickup off the prismatic lens could end up being huge as well. It's an extremely powerful card against this version of the deck. You can see just the scenario that it's in right now, like just Pyro Consecration. It's imperfect, but it's a lot better turn than it would be otherwise if Consecration cost four. Mm. Um, so that particular role with the discounted Consecrate might come into play big for Hunter Ace in this game. Gotta worry about Snipe. Yep. Always gotta think about how the secret's gonna pan out. Something I think is just really cool about the Consecration is it's unnerfing the old equality Consecration combo. <laughs> Shifting it, it back just costs six again. Yeah. 
There's a lot to think about with this uh, Holy Wrath Paladin deck as well. The major goal is empty your deck of all cards by, you know, protecting your life total heal cards and lots of AoE uh, and timeout as well. Get to the end of your deck. You play a Shrivala the Tiger for zero mana. You shuffle it back into your deck with a Baleful Banker and then launch a Holy Wrath for 25 points of damage. Right. That is a difficult task to perform amidst the fact that you have to parse out your resources in a, a fairly close to perfect way. You have to get through your deck very quickly against any deck that's going to apply pressure, in this instance, Hunter. And then at the same time, you have to be doing this while you're managing your hand size. Because this is the kind of turn where Hunter Ace would have been okay with using Prismatic Lens. He just can't. And this is one of those games where Hunter Ace might, you could say quite rightly, feel ever so slightly aggrieved. Because I don't think there are a few more frustrating experiences in Hearthstone than when your opponent's Highlander deck goes one drop secret animal companion hyena alpha subject nine. Like it just doesn't feel fair at that point, does it? They have one of those cards each and they're pretty much the perfect draws for the scenario. Define fair. Uh, things that I like happening. There you go. Okay, <laughs> well, no, in that case there's... That in this current context is my definition of fair. Yeah. I, th I think that what Tice has done is fair so far just because it's just minions. When minions do disgusting, gross things like Reno Relicologist or like King Ferris, when those cards come down on curve King and Ferris. I'm losing, it's like, <laughs> well, that is quite ironic. All right, I'm just going to end my point there. Long story <laughs> short, just minions, oh, those are fair. No. Okay. I was trying to fill up all the time that Tyson's going to take thinking about this turn and see this. <laughs> uh, sorry, I cut you off. We've got to find something else to talk about now. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, speaking of the unfair thing, I mean, do we get to start calling it unfair when Tice has the Zephyrus on top mm -hmm. of the perfect curve of minions as well in his Highlander deck? When you're using it. And what for? I mean, likely you burn damage. Savage Roar? Yep. Oh, it doesn't offer it because the fourth mana is active? This, so it often doesn't... This is something that I found with Zephyrus is that it often doesn't value a huge amount of damage that isn't lethal. And particularly there, because you have the fourth mana available, Zephyrus does very much value Soul of the Forest in positions like that. That's something that I've noticed as well. It really, really loves that card. And probably rightly so, right? Like building a protected board, turning all your 1-1s one later into 2-2s. Two -two. So that's an incredibly powerful thing to be able to do in the scenario. If you played this, the Lynx first, would that have changed the offer? I mean, my guess is the mana consideration is why Soul of the Forest came up over Savage Roar. It only offers mm. basic and classic cards. So if he played the Lynx in that spot before the Zephyrus, he would have had three mana remaining. Right. Would but as I said, it, well, no, as I said, it doesn't necessarily value a huge amount of damage that doesn't end the game yeah. as highly as it does effects like Soul of the Forest. Curious which, about you know, that. Build a board and stick it. These are all just things that you've kind of got to experiment with, with, with Zephyrus and, and learn over time. You know, you can influence Zephyrus's decisions but at the end of the day, he has his own kind of value and belief systems, right? Yeah. Like that you can't affect. You can learn how it works, but you're never going to change it. Let's say wish for the perfect card. Right. <laughs> yeah. He will decide at his leisure whether you receive it or not. There are, of course, the occasional problem where, you know, the strict definition of a perfect card is, is binary and Zephyrus just gets it wrong. And I think those are things that the developers will aim to fix over time. But, you know, whether dealing 15 extra points of damage that don't end the game there is better than a Soul of the Forest. Like, that's something that you can debate. Technically subjective. Yeah. Unless you're talking to me, of course. <laughs> I mean, you could have said seven extra damage. <laughs> I'm on board. One extra damage <laughs> or Soul of the Forest. I mean, the hero power deals two. I'm, I'm convinced. I'll okay. take the Soul of the Forest. Okay. Mountain Giant ended up being pretty good, though. Yeah. And that sound is why. The big noise. Yeah, Mountain Giant, another card that Zephyrus does very heavily keep an eye on. It's a card that you will see a lot. Um, so it's a card that you really need to be aware of. And I think that's potentially something that Tice looked at there and why he did leave the four available, because it did then cost him the four to play the Mountain Giant. Yeah. Quick for Tice here, I am loving the idea of the Snipe and Eagle Horn Bow. It ensures that you get a crack with the Eagle Horn Bow, and it also ensures that if Hunter Ace plays a minion, which is leading up to the point where he's going to need to pretty soon, you get the additional charge on the Eagle Horn Bow. 
Sure. So he's favoring the board presence and the snipe, um, which is, I think, fairly close to the same. I would have favored the bow just simply for the push potential that's happening at the moment. Perhaps, though, concealing the bow means that Hunter Ace tricks himself into trying to stay alive with a, a very low life total, and that gives Tyson opportunity. You know, that's something that every single time I see top players forego damage, that's one of the things they have in their mind when I've talked to them later down the road, mm. like at an event or referencing it, you know, messaging on Discord or whatever. They always tell me, oh, I was trying to surprise my opponent with the amount of damage that I had available afterwards. It was very real last series when Swids did that exact thing with his wrench calibers, and it, it paid off huge. Hmm. You know, usually the great thing about Snipe in this matchup against Paladin is that it can be used to kind of shut down some key effects. Like Wild Pyromancer we talked about earlier, it's very hard to get a Pyro clear going into a Snipe. But fortunately, Crystal Smith Kangor, not the same equation. That Divine Shield means that Hunter Ace can still pick up the full heal. Yeah, and Hunter Ace still has to think about... Nope. He has to think about Rat Trap. Yeah, and he was really going fishing there for better options against this Mountain Giant. Didn't have one available. He does play that uh, additional copy of Subdue in his deck. Wow, even pays respect to unleash the, the hounds in Tice's deck list by not making a single token. Unlikely to be relevant. I uh, like unlikely to be relevant in your benefit. So yeah, I agree turning it down. Tice there had 11 on board plus six from hand with Eagle Horn Life Drinker. He was just one off on that turn as well. Hunter Ace has to go for Shavala. Get to lens sometimes. Nope, you got 10 cards in hand. You do have both Holy Rats in hand, though. So, you know, the question of burning the card being relevant. Let me think. I mean, the issue is the the three damage that still comes through from this uh, Ursatron potentially still ending out the game if you go with the Shivala line. Stop that first. Yep. It's fortunate on the draw. It's time to test your metal. That's got to get shuffled back. Three coming back from the snakes. Oh, quickly. Three on board, three from the weapon, three from the life drinker. That's lethal. There's so many things to think about, and Hunter is just, when it's not being contested on board, he is so good at keeping the pressure going. Tice sticking to accepted card game etiquette, showing all the damage first, so Hunter Ace is free to give it up if he wants, and he does so before those snakes can even come through. Tice picking up game number one in what ends up just being a pretty straightforward game of Highlander Hunter for you. And that is really what happens when a Highlander deck does draw a strong curve like that. It does start to feel a little bit unfair. And I'm going to stick with those words and actually justify it a bit more. Because when a Highlander deck can draw a perfect curve, which is what a consistent deck with two copies of every card is supposed to do, then they're having all the strengths of a conventionally built deck with two copies of each card, but then they also have all the additional strengths of all the flexibility that comes from the range of different effects that they have in their deck. So they get this best of both worlds scenario. Now, the reason why that isn't unfair is that it doesn't happen that often. It's just when you are the player in that moment that's on the receiving end of that feeling where your opponent just curved out perfectly with their Highlander deck, it's just kind of a bummy feeling sometimes. I, I think it's just smart deck building. <laughs> okay. I'm like, sure. look, you look at the way that the mana cost is broken down from this deck. Yes. It's going to do that a lot. It's going to have a secret into a three drop, into a four drop often. Yes. I think in this the, one. The, the four drop is not often exactly hyena out. That's the, the three drop is not often exactly animal companion. Th They're the best ones. That's, that's where it feels unfair for you. Okay. So, you know what I say? Shut up. All right. All right. <laughs> Yeah, fair point. You know what else is unfair? Good point. Well made. Divine spirits and inner fire. All right. You know what else is unfair? The fact that I just get to talk and you all have to listen to me. 
unlucky. Yeah. You know what else is unfair? In fact, we got to go to a quick break and then come uh. back afterwards. So that's what, exactly what we're going to do. When we come back, uh, it's Tice versus Hunter Ace. Game number two is coming up. Hunter Ace, down a game, trying to tie it up. My name is Eddie Liu, formerly Sehun628, now it's just Eddie playing. My last year, I had a pretty successful year, especially since I only played this game for two years. I won Dreamhack Atlanta. Um, it's only a tour stall, but it meant a lot to me, especially since I was grinding really, really hard for a win. When I first knew that, like I received the email that I got into Grandmaster, I was really excited. I checked my email at like 10.30, and I was like hyped, I was like, Oh my god, is this actually real? I think I'm a very consistent player. I think the X factor for myself is that I hate playing aggro decks, I would say. I'm a very control slash anti-control player. I'd rather outgrind my opponent in resources. I constantly judge myself, oh, is this right? Is, is what I'm doing correct? And it means a lot. It means a lot to me that if other people are agreeing what I do and what I think. At this point, I just want to make worlds. I have a pretty good record in, in tour stop. I think I was at least top 10, if not top five. I think I was lucky. I think this group is the easier group and I think I have a good chance getting out of groups. My name is Fei Liang. My handle is DTC. Before Hearthstone, I was playing World of Warcraft. And when I saw Elite Torrent chip in, I think the card is pretty cool. I'm gonna try it. I think the style I like the most is combo deck because there are a lot of win conditions and there are a lot of ways you can win the game. My son plays Hearthstone sometimes. Is he good? He got rank nine. He likes Zoo list. Are you gonna teach your daughter to play Hearthstone? Yeah, of course. Do you think that she'll be better than him? Probably yes, because I think my daughter is way smarter than my, than my boy. <laughs> Getting number one in Grandmaster is going to totally change my life. I think it proved myself and my kids are going to be proud of me. You got to look at Eddie and ETC during the break, who will be playing later on in the inaugural day for season two, later in the Americas, after we're done here in the European region. And that's admirable. And I'm joined by Saddle. Hey. And Saddle, uh, Tice is up to a 1-0 lead right now, and Hunter Ace uh, has protected his mage deck during that protect phase. And it's a Reno mage deck, and he's going to be queuing that up here in game number two. Yeah, it's um, kind of good old-fashioned Reno Mage. It's a very different effect that Reno now has, but this is an archetype that we've seen before 
um, when Reno and Highlander effects were very prevalent in the metagame. And it's back this time. Of course, that Lunar's Pocket Galaxy kind of having its uh, swan song week here in Hearthstone Grandmasters as it's going to go back to the murky depths of seven mana alongside those two uh, Highlander effect cards, Reno the Relicologist and Zephyrus the Great. Zephyrus we've talked about at length, but Admirable, how does this Reno compare to our last Reno? Well, initially I thought this Reno was just not that good. Really? Um, and then as I start to saw it kind of get played, I was like, wait a minute, this is still a mage deck. It still is a good deck. And then I saw Reno like when you're ahead and I was like, whoa, yeah. that just ends games sometimes. I was, I was going to say, it surprised me that you did not think this was a good card because you see this number on here, that's this 10, you know, 10 is a big number, oh, right? You see that card in the, uh, that, num that <laughs> the, the word in the bottom right it says minions. minions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like that was what was concerning me about it. Cause I thought you could just like have a clear board and you're like, Tenya. And then someone pointed out to me it couldn't, and my head just exploded. I was like, that's not nearly as good as no I was picturing. No face damage. This card sucks. Yeah, well, Give me Super Collider, and I'll hit my opponent for three <laughs> in the face over three turns instead. Uh, but at the end of the day, it is still a mage deck, and mage just got a lot of powerful tools right now. And one of the reasons why I think the deck is able to be so greedy at the moment with its top end is specifically Luna's Pocket Galaxy being able to open up that endgame plan massively yep. at the times you draw that card. It's just too good. And they're they're changing it uh, in the next coming balance patch. It's going back to seven mana, I think, where it is, uh, it's rightfully earned its spot to be. Um, but that's going to change the whole dynamic of how Mage has to be built. Like, you're not going to be able to just run a bunch of seven, eight, and nine, and ten cost cards anymore yeah. because you don't have a way to discount them in the deck. You're going to have to actually just spend all that mana at some point. That throws Mage into a whirlwind of deck building as far as I'm concerned. And I, I want to touch on this briefly. I tweeted about this as well, but like I, for one, am personally super happy that they just did a bunch of absurd sounding things to cards, right? Like, you know, Luna's Pocket Galaxy going to five, Christology, you know, one mana draw two, and then, you know, Christology's ended up fine. So they just kind of left it there. Like Holy Wrath Paladin isn't dominating the game. They've just kind of left that chilling. The parts that didn't work, they're going to roll back, like Extra Arms and uh, Luna's Pocket Galaxy. And I think that's a very exciting thing to, you know, consider being possible for the game in the future. It makes me very, very excited for, like, what other things they might do in the future that really play around with, like, the digital space of Hearthstone. Yeah, and that was, that's exactly where I was going to go. You know, back in the day when, when I played cards, you had to go physically obtain hey. the cards. And if a card was too powerful, you had to ban it yeah it, and it was just gone all the work you did going to find those cards as the player they were just gone after that there was no way to change that with the digital space there's so much that's, that's able to be toyed with that and so the fact that it's just been uh more deliberate and i'd say aggressive later lately on i think it's making the game just much more interesting i think powerful cards are very fun i think when cards are too powerful that's when you just go ahead and tone them back right and now both players in what is a very common matchup these days, two of the most powerful decks and classes in the format right now. Mm. And both players really have their, their big power plays available to them. Hunter Ace does have that Luna's Pocket Galaxy locked and loaded. Tice, on the other hand, staring at great removal options with that Restless Mummy, with the Zilliax, with the Omega Devastator, but all leveraged behind that Dr. Boom Mad Genius, which will be able to come down on curve and start competing with some of these minions as well. I'm going to be honest, I'm just worried for Tice in this game. Hunter Ace, Hunter Ace has drawn none of his big minions yet. Yep. And he's going into Coin Galaxy with clear skies. Yep. At the very, very most, Tice could add a Restless Mummy and obtain a 3-1 on board after this. Draw now for Hunter Ace is the Alex Straza, which is very relevant, very, very relevant indeed. It's one of the most effective cards in the deck against Warrior. Tice gives the grin, like, yeah, all right, enjoy it while it lasts, buddy. Five mana pocket galaxy, I get it. Yep. It's, it's important to note for me as well, uh, just the difference in the protection from both players' lineups. You know, Hunter Ace chose to protect Mage. The first player, the only player so far not to protect Warrior. Yeah, Tice protected warrior on his side. Yep. And so what now? Golly, I mean, Hunter is banned away. His warrior deck is banned away. No tomb can hold me. I don't know why I, I omit the words his warrior deck when I first said it. But somehow I did. <laughs> Hunter Ace is just banned. He's too good. He's broken. <laughs> He's gone. Nerf him back to seven. <laughs> just, <laughs> just very vague terms. <laughs> All right, buddy, back to seven mana. <laughs> 
Casper's just like, what? What, the, what, what does that mean? <laughs> you know what it means. How it makes you feel. That's what it means. Back to seven, buddy. That's the face of a man who costs seven mana. <laughs> like Siobot. He looks pained over this turn. He does, yeah. I think he's fighting with the idea of using uh, Conjurer's Calling on this Barista and facing down the Mummy as a result. So right. if you're going to Conjurer's Calling, that means you're using the front half of Ray of Frost. Right. But if you're going to use that front half of Ray of Frost, you could just kill this minion off. Yep. That's certainly the play that leapt out at me as the turn just passed over. Just seemed solid, no reason to do anything spectacular. That one mana barista can make some absolute magic happen with uh, some stuff later on in the game. Not to mention her skills uh, as a barista. Sure. Hear that order she spits out? I do. Perfect. Oh! Hello! The spells do not deserve the same reaction. No, they do not. However, I am looking at power of creation for zero mana. Yes. And there's a barista in hand there's for the Caligos. There is a barista in hand, yeah. Golly. When this deck gets the galaxy early, <laughs> it's just so unfair. <laughs> like, this is unfair. So just in case, again, you haven't really been following Hearthstone, you've been living under a rock for a while, you hear us talking about this card being nerfed uh, back to seven mana where it came from, and you're wondering, hmm, what is that? What makes it so powerful? <sighs> well, this. This is what makes it so powerful. Yeah, it originally cost seven mana. They buffed it to five. Uh, turns out that was too much. If you play it on five or on four, the game kind of just ends. Look, it took players a couple weeks to figure that out, though. It did. Like, there were players debating whether or not you can play it. By the way, Barista also gets the damaged Stegatrons in this instance. Enjoy your three extra cards. Uh, I would call it bootleg Omega, Dev uh, Omega Assembly, but you also get a four or five. What to do? Double Pump Azerano, extra Star Whip, High Mount Knight, Mount Banana Spice coming right up. Got it. No Conjurer's Call. Okay. Do you need to? Mm, good point. I'm so tired. Oh, you better suit up. The Apocalypse is coming. You're going to need a lot more armor than that, Dr. Boob. Yeah. That will offer the Black Knight. Yes. I think for Hunter Ace, it's a matter of figuring out how to start connecting damage. What to yeah, do? Black Knight, what probably Defender do? of Argus in there somewhere as well. It loves that whenever you have minions that can attack. Even when you have minions that can't attack. Yeah, I like saving the Zephyrus in this instance. Agreed. Uh, Hunter Ace has included the copy of Elemental Evocation in his mage deck list as well. Um, it's a really cool card in this mage deck. It's actually one of the things I, I, I really like about it is there's some iterations with Zephyrus early on and later on that can be absolute blowouts. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the game, if your opponent's down to 10 health, you can Elemental Evocation the Zephyrus because he's an Elemental and then Pyroblast. And Zephyrus goes, oh, you have 10 mana left. This is a weird situation that I'm not used to encountering. Yes. Would you like a Pyroblast? Also, early on in Mage games, uh, if you have coin, you can play on turn two, you can coin Elemental Evocation, play Zephyrus, and it will offer you Edwin Van Cleef yes. for an 8-8 eight eight on turn two. Yep. I think that's two really cool iterations that can absolutely win you games that you would not have won otherwise from just adding one card to your deck. Tice, on the other hand, the the iteration that he needs to win this game is that he draws oh, one of the brawls yeah. in his deck. Yeah, that's. I mean, you're just not winning otherwise. Maybe you can defend yourself for a turn. Ziliax is enormous now, right? Two turns. It's had of the buff, I believe. So he does have some ability to restabilize after he gets control of the board, but getting control of the board seems a long way away at this point. Yeah, I mean, he's. it doesn't look like he could safely close the gap no to turn 10. Can hold me. Hunter Ace is protected behind two 512s right now. And 512 taunt is a pretty large stat line. I think good job by Tice to cut as much damage as he could here. Uh, but this is headed one direction. 
So that's 5, 10, 14. He would need 14 additional damage this turn, which does not come from Savage Raw or Bloodlust or any available just direct burn spell. Of course, looking at Zephyrus' perfect card options. I wonder. Yeah, I think Hunter Ace just kind of runs back the turn. I think hanging on to cheap minions like uh, the Mountain Giant right now. It's something I want to reload with in the case of, of uh, Tice, you know, picking up Plague of Wrath or Brawl. What to do? What to do? Important to note that uh, Tice actually does not have a Plague of Wrath in the deck. No, just the two copies of Brawl. Um, I do like playing more stuff here as Hunter Ace. I don't think this board in and of itself is quite enough to just continue uh, forcing. This will offer him Tyrion. <gasps> Inner fire! Oh, no, it's just eight it's damage. Eight damage. Okay. That's so smart! Interesting. I don't think I've ever seen a Zephyrus in a fire situation like that. That was cool. I never thought of that. Hunter Ace has trained his Zephyrus well. Yeah. As well as himself. Yeah, that's what I was saying previously. Like, I think it was important for Hunter Ace to play more stuff just so he was defended against turns like exactly like this, right? Um, he's got a pretty clear indication that his opponent does not have Brawl available. So I think playing into the Brawl isn't the end of the world. There's still no reason necessarily just to play all the way into Brawl with the Mountain Giant. Um, but by loading up all this kind of extra damage, he sets himself up in a spot where he just has damage to spare here with the Conjurer's Calling. Pushing through the big taunt. Hunter Ace now going to square up the series off the back of soon-to-be-departed Five Mana Luna's Pocket Galaxy. Yes. Uh, I think off of some pretty fancy stuff that I that we saw in that game as well, uh, the thing for me namely is manipulating the Zephyrus into offering Inner Fire. That was cool. I really did not consider Inner Fire in that position. You can tell that that was, that was not by chance. That was Hunter Ace engineering. One mana left, 412 on board. Got the Inner Fire offered by, by the good boy Zephyrus, and he snap picked it. He knew that's what he was looking for. It came up as he expected, and he executed the game plan. And that, to me, is why Zephyrus is such an exciting card, because it's a card that you actually get better at playing over time. Like, it's it's a time that, you know, you, you can feel the the feedback loop of practice really pay off for you as you start to understand how to manipulate and exploit this card better and then the opposite thing from the opponent side as well like i think when people get really really good at understanding zephyrus you can set up board states in a fashion where you know what zephyrus will offer your opponent based on like the board states that you've created yourself and it's just an incredibly deep rabbit hole that some of the best players in the world will be able to dig down into oh, why is it here for only two more years of this card. <laughs> That's kind of what I'm thinking to myself in this one. But yeah, I, I, you know, Hunter Ace, I think, just fully demonstrating the power of Mage in that one. Uh, when it draws Luna's Pocket Galaxy, I think it is way too powerful, and everyone has agreed at this point. So yep. let's move on to our third game now, where Hunter Ace has his Paladin and his Priest deck remaining in this one. He's playing with Combo Priest uh, and the Holy Wrath Paladin deck, which we saw uh, fall very quickly in game number one to a strong draw from Tice's Highlander Hunter deck. Um, and so Hunter Ace is going to be on Priest for this one, and Tice is running back to Warrior deck. So this is a matchup I think that uh, we could very much be in store for, even post-balance changes. Dr. Boom's going to be moved to 9 mana. Extra Arms is being moved back to 3 mana. And those are two very critical cards in both of these decks. For Priest, I think it gets hit a lot harder with Extra Arms being 3 mana, as it means your 1-drops don't pack the same punch as they do right now. Perhaps it just means a change of the deck in philosophy and overall, where instead of trying to just blow out your opponent with early pressure yes. and having one thing live, you go a different direction. But I digress. Uh, this is a matchup where I feel like Warrior is at a pretty substantial edge if it can get past the early game with any sign of safety with it. And that is not as easy to do as you might suspect, though. I think, you know, the the effect of Nausea Cleric early, the effect of Extra Arms early, really any early minion you know you can coin river croc into extra arms against warrior and the game kind of ends a lot of the time because you're, you're just beating them down with this big beating stick that they can't deal with um if you're if you proceed along with that pace by the time they get to their restless mummy your minion already has seven nine eleven hell you know how, however much health you've chosen to give it quite frankly 
Um, so yes, you are correct. It is all about just getting through that early game for the Warrior, and then they can stabilize to a ridiculous degree. Uh, but it's easier said than done in some scenarios. And you see here for Hunter Ace, extra arms kept. Dug for that one drop. Doesn't find it, though, but he does have the uh, Nefset Ritualist to be able to go off on now the Tolvir as well. So he is a, a turn slower than he might like, but still some damage available to be ramped up very quickly. I think he still might be spot on with this. You know, the coin from Tice, I think, is going to have to be used very aggressively this game. Uh, we'll have to see how the draw pans out. The two things that I want to note uh, is that Tice does have a copy of Iron Beak Owl in the deck. So there is the threat of silence stuff for Hunter Ace. I think he should be very willing to uh, try to get the game this snowballed early. Uh, and number two is for Hunter Ace's deck, he's running the two copies of Silence with a copy of Topsy Turvy. And there are no copies of uh, Holy Ripple that are in the deck. And so his longevity prospect, not nearly as much there. His all-in prospect, very much more powerful. And so those are the two things I think for him to keep in mind is how does he best deliver a killing blow with a risk versus reward system. So here's why I call this a turn too slow. You can look at the scenario Hunter Ace gets into. Going second, having to play his two drop on turn two instead of on turn one with the coin. Now, if he jams extra arms on, he makes a five health minion and he passes back to Tice, who has coin available for a rush minion oh. that Hunter Ace knows he's drawn. We can see it's on the far left, but Hunter Ace knows that there's a rush minion drawn off that town crier. That's the problem with just being a turn too slow here in the matchup, is that you cannot just run away with the game like that with just minion into extra arms unless you have the one drop if you're going first. If you're going second, yeah, you can do it with the coin. Works out fine. Um, but when you're going first, you need that one drop to guarantee snowball. Otherwise, uh, Warrior has the counterplay to shut you down. I'm not quite sold on it yet. I'm looking at Tice's hand, and it definitely seems like it's going to be good enough to get the job done. However, I do think that there are draws from Hunter Ace's side that can really change the landscape of this game. Uh, and the biggest one that I'm looking at personally is Northshire Cleric, and then probably Circle of Healing. I think if Hunter Ace finds those two cards uh, in the next couple of turns, honestly, that is a huge amount of gas he's going to have to work with. And that's really, I think, one of the faults of this priest deck is that when it doesn't have the card draw, it really falls by the wayside. Access denied. You don't get the card draw and you don't get just the massive snowball off the early game, then yeah, it can look a little bit hopeless every now and again. Yeah, and, and this is a play that I was concerned from on Tyson's side is if he did not take care of this 2-6 right now, what that could yield Hunter Ace in the future. Oh, yeah, I mean, so Tice here was in somewhat of a sticky spot because he knows he wants to use those restless mummies, those key removal options to take care of like big obnoxious threats. Um, but that's the problem with the priest deck is that every, every minion is potentially a big obnoxious threat. Um, but just on the flip side of that, if Tice restless mummies this 2-6 and takes care of it, then Hunter Ace can start snowballing with extra arms because then he, he then knows wonder. that the Restless Mummy is gone. Threat but of Psycho Pomp. The threat of Psycho Pomp is, is uh, able to come down as well on curve. But now, because the minion is left up, Hunter Ace can just make this individual minion huge. And now he has that base. He has the base that he needs. It's a minion that really starts to threaten lethal over the next couple of turns. Nine, nine health, 10 maximum health is a huge number, even for dealing damage through warrior armor. It's got a nice stat line. Dynamatic doesn't answer it. Restless Mummy doesn't answer it. And that was the one kind of slip up I think that Tice could not afford this game. I think his hand gave him a position where he needed to try to check it on a piece for piece basis. He opted to play around Psycho Pomp and then just fell victim to Extra Arms, the card that Hunter Ace kept in his opening hand. Yeah. What card would he have kept that he hadn't played right now? I think it's a fairly solid read that that left-hand card is Extra Arms. At that Northshire point. Cleric comes to mind. Perhaps Hunter Ace would hold it instead of playing it on turn one because they wouldn't have had Extra Arms. Like that, I think that's a possible read to make. Sure, no. yeah. That, that seems more difficult to me than just Extra Arms though. Like I think Extra Arms is the card you definitely automatically keep. And Northshire Cleric not coming down on one, that tells me a lot of times that it's just not there. Light the fuses! Doesn't clear off the two Ooh. on here either. Ooh, hoo, hoo. Circle of Healing, second Nefeset Ritualist, both of which can be incredibly punishing here. Tice knows that he's set up um, one of the most impressive decks in the metagame right now just for basically everything they want to do. If there was a Norsha Cleric in hand for Hunter Ace right now, this could be an enormous pop-off turn. 
as it stands. Oh. No such thing! But that's huge. Now options for Hunter Ace. Does he value damage? Does he value the value trade? I was thinking the Divine Spirit this turn. Heal up your thing, Divine Spirit, and just smash face. I think smashing the minion makes a lot of sense if you're going to do something like that, too. Heal. When you say heal your minion, with what? The the Ritualist. That's, you're potentially conceding the game to Brawl at that point, I think. If you, have a, if you have a Divine Spirit invested in a minion and there's three minions on board, that's usually a position you want to avoid against Warrior. I'll tell you what, I think it's a bad matchup. You don't need to Divine Spirit, I guess, would be the uh, the real argument there. It's got 12 yeah. health. You know? <laughs> like... Yeah, exactly. In my head, it didn't have 12 health. It had, like, eight for some reason. Okay. And I'm just, like, completely underestimating how much two extra arms and a power word shield does. Yeah. <laughs> On a 2-6, yeah. by the way. And Tice just, unless he draws Brawl or Iron Beak for the rest of the game, that 6-12 is going to be in play, basically. What now? If he had had Brawl... If he had had Iron Beak Owl, I love the way that Tice would have taken this slow and baited out those important cards from Hunter Ace. We yeah, don't sure. have the goods. Uh, I like playing it for face value. However, there is something to be said about, you know, perhaps the bluff equity or, uh, you know, the respect that Hunter Ace might hold for you in that regard. If you don't play those cards and you play weak, what Hunter Ace just interpreted is, though, perhaps you have those answers. Try to play another way. Cleric now for Hunter Ace. It is a turn too late in terms of he's basically used every mass healing card that he had available in the early game, which was those two Nefeset Ritualists. But it's still a Cleric. And a Cleric is a card that you are never upset to see when playing Priest. I wonder... There's a Balancing Act now for Hunter Ace. Whether he's convinced himself that Tice does or does not have Brawl at this point. I must consider. I don't think giving value over to an Eternium Rover is super relevant in the matchup. Like, armor totals, unless they get absolutely out of hand for the Warrior, are not the most uh, important thing in the world. If you're able to just keep sticking a, you know, a 612 on the board. Oh my. Two. Yeah, so the sequencing there was just to shred the armor off. Yep. Ty starts this turn with four armor. Then suddenly, things like uh, Zilliax and Shield Slam start to look a little bit more promising. Would only be, what, 11 in total, even if the four armor were there. So it still wouldn't take care of the 612, but it's still just correct uh, micro sequencing from Hunter Ace. What now? Shield block would make you vulnerable. Restless mummy shield slam. Those sorts of things. Yeah, Tice is in a tough spot. None of these plays what are matching now? up well. Damage off of killing it. And that means that armor's getting shredded away again. Does that mean we're shield slamming a Norsha Cleric? Well, I think that you're concerned about dying as well, so I think there's justification to shield slamming that. Okay. Reduce the amount of uh, burst damage potential from a Divine Spirit. It's reasonable um, because we've seen both Nefeset Ritualists. I think that play has a lot more merit because of that. Circle of healing, obviously, you know, it's full, but it's not a full heal. Is someone injured? Well, it might end up being a full heal this turn. It depends on what these two cards are. One. It's Divine Spirit number two. There's the circle of healing. Wow. Four extra cards. And the 6-3 goes to a 6-7, and then a 14 and a 28. There's the inner no, fire. No mana for the inner fire on top of that, though. High Priest Ahmet joins the hand. Psychopomp joins the hand. It 
he gonna push 17 this turn? He is. Quickly. 19. Ooh, even more. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I thought one of the two threes was uh, wasn't green. Even more. Mm. Nothing. There's not a way out of that. Technically alive? Right? Well played. Scoops it up. Yeah. And Hunter Ace takes it two games to one. Strut the power. Two of the decks that are regarded as the actual power decks of the format. You know, Warrior does a great job at tackling a lot of problems that are thrown at it. But where it can struggle are versus the absolute power problems that can be presented with it. Ludus Pocket Galaxy providing way too much uh, tempo in the later stages. And then Divine Spirit Combo Priest here just being able to sustain a big minion. Like, that is a problem for Warrior decks who don't, that don't run executes right now. It's just not a good enough card to run. Like, I'm surprised that there's no Plague of Wrath in Tice's deck. I think that's one of the most powerful cards that Warrior has in the deck list right now. It does. It changes the matchup enormously. Um, not in the least because of, like, Wild Pyromancer. Like, Wild Pyromancer is actually one of your card draw engines in the deck. So a lot of turns, you, like, pop off with a with a Pyro and a Cleric and a Circle of Healing or whatever. But obviously, that ends the turn with you just having a bunch of damaged minions sat on the board from the Wild Pyromancer. So it doesn't even need a setup card a lot of the time from the Warrior. They can just throw out the Plague of Wrath and take care of it. Um, but there was a really like crucial moment in that last game from Tice's side, and that was the decision as to whether or not to kill that two six at the um, on turn four with the restless mummy. Chose to respect the threat of psycho pump coming down. Chose to keep his removal options for threats that could end up being more relevant later on. Um, but the extra arms and the more arms came down after that, and he just that that minion was still just plugging away at the end of the game. He just was not able to get a handle of it whatsoever. Yes, all those extra arms provided a very Goro-like beating at the end of the day. Hunter Ace is ready for an interview. Hunter Ace, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can hear you guys. How's it going? Very good. Congratulations on your win here uh, on the first day of Season 2 here for Grandmasters. Uh, I want to start things off with uh, the big question that I'm going to be pitching everybody. Uh, your thoughts on the changes for Season 2 overall? Uh, so uh, going into season two, we have a different format with uh, shield format, and uh, I think it's pretty exciting. I uh, always love it when they change it up a bit. I think specialists got a bit stale towards the end, and uh, not too much you can do. I feel that for the first week now, most people brought kind of similar lineups, but I still don't think I've gotten the grasp of the format, and there's a ton of things I can do. I'm not particularly happy with my lineup this week, but I won't go too much into why. But I think there's lo lots of room for improvement. So I want to ask you about the, the, the shield and ban phase that we had. All three other players that have played so far have protected their warrior, and you protected mage. Like, has it surprised you that you've been the only one protecting mage so far? Uh, I, I understand why people protect warrior. It has a lot of good matchups on paper, and uh, that makes a lot of sense. I personally like mage a lot, but uh, there's... Even with my lineup, there's different ways you can approach the the ban and pick phase. Even in the matchup I have versus Tice, it's not necessarily that the ban the protect mage mage uh, way to do it is the correct one. But it changes up a bit. And uh, I'm facing uh, Colento, I believe, later this week or this weekend. That has the exact same lineup, so I won't go too much into uh, okay. why I picked picked what I did. But I think mage is a very good deck, yeah. Well, I want to talk about your, your mage play next. Uh, you had some pretty fancy stuff uh, with Zephyrus in that particular game. You know, I'm going to ignore the Luna's Pocket Galaxy part. I want to talk, <laughs> I want to hone in on Zephyrus. I have heard a lot of stories of you yeah, finding very, very clever uh, Zephyrus lines in this one. I, I want to know how much you've toyed around with this card and some of the coolest stuff that you've uh, managed to pull off with Zephyrus. I've toyed around a lot with Zephyrus, and uh, I've learned from missing out on stuff. And I've also learned from... Uh, Zephyrus just missing out on what I want. <laughs> so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, it takes a lot of time. It's a super cool card. And uh, uh, just from playing it more and more experience, you get used to the different options. Like uh, Inner Fire, I think the only scenario you ever get Inner Fire is with Caligos on board. So you kind of have that played it before <laughs> to actually recognize that. 
Yeah, yeah, because I didn't see it at all. Like when the inner fire came up, I was like, whoa, I've never seen that before. That's so cool. But yeah, it makes sense. Um, I'm actually not going to ignore the Lunar's Pocket Galaxy. I'm going to point out but you only won because of a broken card in Lunar's Pocket Galaxy and a broken card in Extra Arms. So I'm looking forward to you being completely washed up next week when you can't just win <laughs> yeah. with broken cards. It's true. It's true. Uh, my, my, my hand it's was true. totally used in that game. Don't reinforce his insult. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's true. It was... Uh, Pretty broke back, not gonna lie. I feel a bit bad for Tice there. You won the world championship with two copies of Ancestral Healing and a Hench Clan sneak. And we didn't have those powerful cards back, day, back then. But it's a true story. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Going back to Hench Clan sneaks and Ancestral it. Healings. Yeah, Hench Clan sneak actually almost made it to my lineup this weekend. Oh. But, but not spicy. quite. Maybe, maybe next time. Maybe next all time. All right. All right. <laughs> All right, Water. Well, thank you very much for joining us, and congratulations on your win. And I'm looking forward to All seeing right. you play this weekend. Talk to you guys later. I just, I just call him like I see him, man. I don't know. Why I don't know what your problem agree is. With you, because <laughs> I'm right. You're partially right. I'll give you partially. He's definitely not going to be washed up next week. I'll, I'll for sure <laughs> wind that part back. Yeah. You are not correct about that part. No, I'm not. He will not. No. In fact, I'm excited to see what he brings next week. I think he's a he's a brewer, and I think that uh, him talking about Zephyrus a little bit there and how much he's uh, both succeeded and failed with Zephyrus along his side yeah. is a tale that could only be told with uh, a story of a man who finds a lamp in a cave somewhere and tricks the genie into giving him a free